My name is Jeff Wolschlager. I'm the VP of Composite Technology at Altair Engineering. We wanted to do a short course on an introduction to multi-scale designer for continuous fiber reinforced material product forms. The agenda for the entire short course involves uh, three uh, sessions. Um, the first session will cover multi-scale material model development using the forward process. Uh, within that session, we'll cover unit cell model development, linear material characterization, in which I'll give a, a quick introduction to homogenization theory, and nonlinear material characterization, uh, where I'll also give an introduction to fundamental material behavior and an introduction to dehomogenization theory. The second session will cover simulation using multi-scale material models, and the third session will cover multi-scale material model development using the inverse characterization process. Okay, well, let's get started into the multi-scale material model development uh, using the forward process. So the forward process is characterized as given matrix and fiber constituent properties, calculate the homogenized ply properties. Uh, this involves a direct single step solution. Um, there's no optimization loop that, that is required. And it produces approximate material models that are really good for material design or material selection uh, and or concept design studies. So again, uh, what we're solving in the forward process is having known or given matrix material behavior and known or given fiber material behavior, uh, we can calculate the composite ply homogenized behavior. Uh, that would result from that material uh, matrix and fiber selection. To contrast that with the inverse characterization process, which we'll talk about in the third session video, um, in the inverse characterization process, we're given the homogenized ply properties. So we're given exactly the opposite. <clears throat> and we're trying to calculate the constituent matrix and fiber properties that will give me the homogenized ply properties back again. So this obviously requires some sort of optimization loop where we make an initial guess at the matrix and fiber behavior. Uh, we calculate the homogenized behavior, ply, homogenized ply behavior with a forward process. Uh, we assess the difference or the error between the calculated uh, behavior and the actual given uh, experimental behavior and use that error to make a determination as to a selection of new matrix and fiber uh, behaviors uh, for which I can recalculate the homogenized ply behavior again. Um, we keep doing this until the error is such that uh, it's within a tolerance that is acceptable. Um, and, um, and at which case we uh, know the matrix and fiber behavior that will give me the homogenized uh, ply behavior back again. So, Inverse characterized material models produce highly accurate material models that are really good for detailed design and certification efforts. But we're going to be working on the forward process to begin with. Let's do an example, work through a complete example of a unidirectional carbon fiber reinforced plastic, uh, CFRP. Um, and let's create a multi-scale material model of this unidirectional CFRP using the forward homogenization process. Some product details, uh, we'll be working with a standard modulus carbon fiber and a standard modulus uh, epoxy polymer matrix. The cure ply thickness of this particular unidirectional uh, product form is 0 0.006 inches. The fiber density is 1.79 grams per centimeter cubed. The fiber aerial weight of the unidirectional product is 150 grams per square meter. And that results in a fiber volume fraction of uh, approximately 55%. The product is also elevated temperature cured at 270 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're going to be producing a multi-scale material model at room temperature or test temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So we do have a minus 200 degree Fahrenheit delta T. So I do want to note that even though we will be demonstrating this process on CFRP, uh, the fundamental techniques apply equally well to GFRP, glass fiber reinforced plastic, uh, MMCs, metal matrix composites, CMCs, ceramic matrix composites, 
um, and all other continuous fibrous material product forms. So the multi-scale material model development process involves three steps. Uh, step one is unicell model definition. There are two uh, ways to define a unit cell. Uh, we can use the parametric unit cell library, or we can create our unit cells through an external unit cell import. Uh, we will be using the parametric unit cell library for this example. Um, step two involves linear material characterization. You can, again, use a forward or inverse approach. Uh, for that step, we will be using a forward approach. And step three involves nonlinear material characterization, where again, you have the choice of a forward or an inverse. Uh, and in this series, we'll be using the forward approach. So step one, unit cell uh, model definition. Um, the parametric unit cell library is uh, quite extensive, contains uh, various fibrous particle woven and lattice and core unit cells. Um, that are parametrically built uh, for you. Uh, we will be working with the fibrous unit cells because uh, those are the continuous fiber reinforced product forms. We have two packing arrangements, uh, uh, square packing and hexagonal packing. Uh, hexagonal packing tends to uh, approximate the uh, random uh, packing arrangements of continuous fibers more closely than does uni. So we'll use the hexagon, our square. So we'll use the hexagonal packing arrangement um, we have each of those packing with and without an interface. Um, we will use a unit cell without it, which uh, for the purposes of this session, will assume perfect bonding between the fiber and the matrix. However, you do not have to assume that. If you used an interphase model, um, you could define some sort of partial uh, or even uh, complete unbond between the fiber uh, and the matrix. We will mention that you're not limited to our parametric unit cell library. Um, you can use an external unit cell. Um, basically, any uh, you can create uh, an external unit cell in any preprocessor of your choice, uh, and you simply can import that into Multiscale Designer. Uh, we do support the Optistruct.fem and Abacus.imp uh, mesh data formats, uh, but once you have a external unit cell built and you have imported it into Multiscale Designer, it works exactly the same as any other parametric unit cell for which I'm going to be showing. So the process is completely unchanged, whether you're using our parametric unit cells or an external unit cell that you develop on your own. Okay, so let's start with the unit cell model definition. Um, I will show this uh, live. So here's multi-scale designer. Uh, we're going to create a new material file. Let's call this uni forward. Uh, you can see as soon as we start a new material, the uh, GUI uh, guides us as to the steps that have to be completed. Uh, the unit cell model definition uh, has no icon next to it, saying it's the current step that needs to be completed. And the linear and nonlinear material characterization both have red X icons next to them, indicating that these steps cannot be started because a prior step has not been completed. So let's start our unit cell model definition. Uh, you can see we have the parametric model tab and the external model tab where I can import uh, an external model that is available, but we'll be working with the parametric uh, unit cell model. Uh, we can pick from fibrous particle woven lattice core in the model definition. We're gonna be working with the fibrous. And then of course the various configurations are square packing and our hexagonal packing. We'll be working with the hexagonal uh, unidirectional continuous unit cell. We can input the data as a straight volume fraction. Uh, so I could say 55% uh, in this particular case, and that would be enough to define all the geometry of this particular parametric unit cell. Uh, but just another way to enter data would be manufacturing data. So if I knew the cure ply thickness, um, 006 in this case, the fiber density, 1.79 grams per centimeter cubed, and the fiber aerial weight, which is normally available for most continuous reinforced product forms, um, that would be uh, enough to calculate uh, the volume fraction, which ends up being 55% approximately. Um, so uh, normally we don't have to worry about meshing controls. I would just accept the defaults uh, as is. We're calculating an element size appropriate based on the geometry. Um, and we'll go ahead and run this step. When you hit run, uh, that's going to go off and build a 
uh, finite element model uh, using uh, HyperMesh uh, scripting capabilities behind the scenes. Um, and it will generate this uh, unit cell finite element model for you automatically. Okay, so the unit cell is done. Um, you can look at some statistics to that unit cell. Um, you can see the number of nodes, number of elements. Um, you can see the uh, uh, for the matrix phase, how many elements are in the matrix phase, and that it is 45%, uh, which means the fiber phase is uh, 55%. Um, so a little bit of information there. You could also look at this unit cell if you wanted to uh, in HyperWorks. If I click this, it would bring up the, the model in HyperWorks. Uh, I won't do that uh, for now. Okay, so uh, this step is complete. Uh, whenever I finish a step, I always save that step in the step window and then go ahead and close the step out. Okay, we can move on to step two, which is a linear material characterization. We're going to be using the forward homogenization approach. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, show this in the GUI again. Uh, so uh, unit cell model definition step is done. I have a green check now. Um, my current step is the linear material characterization, and I cannot yet start nonlinear material characterization because I have to finish the linear material characterization. So we're going to go into the linear material characterization step, and you can see right away that I have the forward homogenization tab and the inverse characterization tab. We are going to be working with the forward homogenization approach in this particular session. Session three, we'll go over the inverse uh, characterization approach. Um, we have various different types of material models you can generate, density, thermal conductivity, diffusivity, elasticity. We're going to be working with elasticity models, although there are others that you could generate. Although, um, elasticity is probably the most common. What we need to do in this step is we need to assign material properties, elasticity material properties, to the phases of my unit cell. So my unit cell is made up of a matrix phase and a fiber phase. And all of the elements of the matrix phase and all of the elements of the fiber phase need to be given material properties. And we can do that here. Um, so you can either directly enter in the material properties of the matrix. If they're isotropic, they could also be transversely isotropic, orthotropic, or even anisotropic. However, generally we don't know what these properties are. Uh, and so we provide a constitutive material database um, that allows you to select um, some generic material properties for various classes of materials. So we're working with a matrix phase here. So I'm uh, going to be working with a polymer matrix material. So we want to go into our material class polymer. And the subclass is going to be thermoplastic or thermal set. We're working with a thermal setting uh, polymer matrix here. And we can pick our unit system. Uh, I'll use US inches in this case. And then all the materials that are available to you show up. Uh, you can see here we have a, a standard modulus epoxy, which is what we want to work with. When I hit select, it will populate the fields with that particular materials properties. If I wanted to look at another material property, say a cyanide ester, and I hit select, it'll populate with those particular properties. So pretty easy to quickly go through some materials and see the property values that are um, uh, available for that particular material class. Okay, I'm happy with the standard modulus epoxy for the matrix phase. We'll go ahead and close that out. We'll flip over to our fiber phase and we need to enter in the properties of the fiber. Uh, in the fiber case, we'll, we'll pick the fiber material class. Um, we have aramids, which are Kevlar's, carbon fibers, glass fibers, others, which is mostly uh, uh, natural fibers. We're in the carbon fiber class. We'll again use our US inch unit system, uh, although I could pick another unit system if I so desired. And you can see here that I have a standard modulus carbon fiber in the database. So I can pick that and carbon fibers are transversely isotropic. It knows that. So it automatically fills out the transversely isotropic properties of the carbon fiber appropriately. Okay. I additionally want to uh, define a couple of laminates so we can homogenize uh, for this matrix and fiber. What are the properties of the unidirectional product form, which you'll see. But I could also homogenize various laminates. So let's define uh, four laminates quickly. We'll have an all zero laminate uh, for layup one. For layup two, we'll define an all 90 laminate. Uh, for layup three, we'll define uh, our 45 minus 45, otherwise known as a in-plane shear. And we'll make that a 45 minus 45 symmetric. So this is really four plies because I'll make it symmetric. Um, and then for laminate four, we will do a quasi-isotropic uh, so a minus 45, 0, 45, 
90 symmetric. Um, so that's actually eight plies. So uh, an all zero, an all 90, uh, a plus minus 45 uh, symmetric, and a minus 45, zero, 45, 90 symmetric. Okay, now that we have everything entered, we can go ahead and run this step. So we'll hit run. Uh, this is going to go off and uh, solve the unit cell uh, to homogenize the properties, to give me the homogenized properties of that particular unit cell. You can see it's done already. So if I want to look at the results, um, the results come back as, um, uh, as uh, various tabs. So in the micro tab, uh, I have just a repeat of the matrix data and the fiber data that I entered. Um, not as important. Uh, the, mi the macro tab, I have the results of the homogenized unidirectional ply. So here you can see the homogenized modulus and Poisson's ratio. So EX uh, is 17.8 MSI. Uh, EY is 1.1 MSI, uh, et cetera. GXY is 0.55 uh, MSI. You also get the inner laminar shears, GYZ, GXZ. Uh, which are 0.4 MSI and 0.55 MSI, respectively. And then the bottom line, you get all of the Poisson's ratios. Uh, so VXY would be uh, 0.287, uh, VYX, uh, so the minor of uh, VXY would be 0.018, uh, effectively. Uh, right below that, you get the full stiffness matrix. Normally, you don't need this, but this is the full 6x6 six six stiffness matrix for that unidirectional material product form. You also get the homogenized thermal expansion, so the coefficient of thermal expansion alpha, so full orthotropic nature. Uh, in our case, it's transverse isotropic, the uh, unidirectional ply. Um, you see a slightly negative uh, coefficient of thermal expansion of the ply, which is common for uh, carbon fiber unidirectional product forms. Uh, 20 uh, e to the minus 6 uh, coefficient of thermal expansion in the uh, matrix and transverse uh, and through thickness direction. Um, you also get the density. In addition to that, we, uh, in addition to the unidirectional ply, we get the homogenized values of the laminates that we entered. So the first laminate that's of interest anyway would be the plus minus 45 because the zero and 90 would just be uh, a 90 degree rotation of the ply, nothing super interesting. But the plus minus 45 has a modulus of 1.9 uh, MSI EX. Um, and uh, a shear modulus of uh, 0.46 uh, MSI, or I'm sorry, 4.6 uh, MSI. Um, and uh, all the other properties are, are listed here. Of course, you also get the full stiffness matrix, which isn't uh, really needed for uh, your cases, but you get the uh, homogenized thermal uh, coefficient of thermal expansion and the, the density, which will be the same as a single unidirectional product because it doesn't involve other material layers. Um, you get the same thing for the quasi-isotropic. So where I was uh, for the uh, plus minus 45, I was at, you know, effectively 2 MSI. For the quasi, I'm at 6.7 MSI. Remember, the unidirectional product was at 18 or 17.8 MSI. So all of this makes sense with, with our intuition and, and what, uh, what we'd expect it to be. Um, you'll also see that uh, we have the underscore C tabs. So the uh, tabs that do not have an underscore C are tension behavior, and those that are underscore C are the compression behavior. So um, for the unidirectional ply, I have a compression modulus of 16.1 MSI, where um, in tension, I had you know 17.8. I would expect that it would be less stiff in compression than, um, than in tension. And you get the full orthotropic uh, set of engineering constants and the full... Uh, uh, orthotropic set of coefficient of thermal expansions uh, in addition. Uh, same thing with the, uh, with the laminates uh, in compression. Um, you get the same results. Okay, so I'm complete with this step. So uh, I always save my step and then uh, exit out. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what the program did. Uh, an introduction to homogenization. It's also known as upscaling. Um, so we are considering the material as one homogeneous material when it's actually made up of two or more materials. So we uh, just uh, entered in the fiber and matrix properties, but we wanted to determine uh, what would the homogenized material properties be as if the fibers and matrix weren't there at all. Um, 
So there's two fundamental approaches to homogenization. There is the mechanics of materials approach, which is an approximate solution. And there is the theory of elasticity approach, which is the exact solution. The theory of elasticity is what multi-scale designer implements, but we'll talk about the mechanics and material approaches just by way of introduction into why the theory of elasticity approach is probably the way to go. So the mechanics and material approaches, there are many, many different approaches, but they really all exhibit the same issues, that they are computationally efficient. I can solve them very fast, but they're generally not very accurate, at least not in all directions. Um, the simplest of these uh, mechanics and materials approaches is the rule of mixtures. Um, it is accurate in the fiber direction, but not accurate in the transverse matrix direction. So just by way of review, I'm sure everybody has seen this in their uh, uh, mechanics and materials or material science 201 courses. Uh, in the fiber direction, we have uh, springs in parallel. And whenever we have springs in parallel, we're talking about equivalent strain boundary conditions. So the strain in, of the homogenized product is the same as the strain in the fiber, is the same as the strain in the matrix. And when I combine that with the constitutive equation, stress equals E strain, I end up with a final result that we're all very familiar with, that the homogenized Young's modulus is equal to the uh, Young's modulus of the fiber times its volume fraction plus the Young's modulus of the matrix times its volume fraction. And this equation tends to be very accurate in the fiber direction. But if we were to look in the matrix direction, I have uh, springs in series. And whenever I have springs in series, I have equivalent stress boundary conditions that the homogenized stress uh, in the two direction has got to be equal to the uh, fiber stress in the two direction. It's got to be equal to the matrix stress in the two direction, which actually is the uh, not appropriate uh, assumption. This is the inaccuracy uh, in this particular method, but can't solve it uh, simply without that assumption. If you combine that with the constitutive equations, you end up with the uh, traditional lower bound equation that we're uh, all familiar with that the homogenized modulus in the two direction is equal to the Young's modulus of the fiber times the Young's modulus of the matrix all over the Young's modulus of the fiber times the volume fraction of the matrix plus the Young's modulus of the matrix times the volume fraction of the fiber. This equation uh, is known to have rather significant error and has always led to the issue associated with mechanics and material approaches to homogenization. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, the theory of elasticity approach, which is actually what is implemented in multi-scale designer. And it's very computationally efficient now with current resources. If anything, that's what's changed in the last half a decade, a decade or so. Uh, and of course, it's very, very accurate. So how does the theory of elasticity through homogenization work? Well, we start with the full anisotropic stiffness matrix. So written out here, uh, stress equals C strain. Uh, where the stiffness matrix is the full six by six, 21 unique constants in the limit for an anisotropic material since it's a symmetric matrix. Uh, and the stiffness matrix relates the full 3D strain tensor uh, to the full 3D stress tensor, as you see here. We're going to manipulate the anisotropic stiffness matrix uh, equation, stress equals C strain, by applying six different periodic boundary conditions to our unit cell. Specifically, we're going to uh, apply a unit strain in each of the normal directions and a unit shear strain in each of the shearing planes individually um, to this unit cell with all other strains being zero than the strain that I am, unit strain that I am applying. And so how does that do anything for me? Well, let's take a look at our equation as we apply these unit strains. So let's take a look at the first uh, periodic boundary condition where I'm applying a strain in the one direction, a unit strain in the one direction, and all other strains are zero, as you can see here in this deformed shape. Well, since it's row times column and all other strains are zero, columns two through six are zeroed out, and all I'm left with is column one. And since I applied a unit strain, um, it says that the first column of the stiffness matrix is just the average stress in the direction uh, that we're looking at uh, due to a unit strain in the one direction. So I've applied a one direction strain and I'm clearly going to get a one direction stress. And if I were to take the average stress over this whole unit cell, that would be the C11 component. But when I 
applied the one direction strain, I also build up two direction stresses because Poisson's effects would want to happen in the two direction, but I'm not allowing them to happen because I have to have a zero strain environment in the two direction. So you can see that two direction stresses will build up. Well, that is the C21 uh, value. So if I take the average stress over this whole unit cell, that's C21. So the way these subscripts work is the stress in the two direction due to a strain, a unit strain in the one. C31 is a, the stress in the three direction due to a unit strain in the one, as you see here, and then so on. C41 is the uh, shear stress in the one, two plane due to a normal strain in the one direction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so after the first boundary condition, I have the first column numerically of the stiffness matrix. Well, how do I get the second column? I apply the second periodic boundary condition where I'm applying a unit strain in the two direction um, and all other strains are zero. And so now all I'm left with in my equation is the second column. And I simply calculate the average stresses in each direction. And that is my second column of the stiffness matrix. How do I get the third? I apply my third direction boundary condition. How do I get the fourth? I apply my, this is my first shearing direction. So I apply my periodic shear uh, boundary condition in the one, two plane. Um, and I calculate all my stresses again. It just so happens that for these materials, the normal stresses will be zero uh, and only the uh, in-plane shear stress will be uh, something other than zero. The other ones will be zero again. So all I have is a four, four number here. The other ones will uh, uh, equate numerically to, to zero when I actually perform those uh, integrals for the averages. Okay, so going through this process, we end up with a full and complete stiffness matrix numerically derived. But the stiffness matrix is not written simply in terms of the engineering constants, the compliance matrix is. So I, I have to start with stress equals C strain. I already uh, have this numerical matrix. I need to get strain equals S stress or the compliance matrix. That's simple enough. All I have to do is invert the stiffness matrix to get the compliance matrix. I can do that numerically. I still have a six by six uh, a set of numbers numerically. And now I know the various compliance matrices for isotropic, transverse isotropic, orthotropic, even full anisotropic, which would be full 21 numbers here, relative to the engineering constants. So I can just solve component by component uh, what the engineering constant is given the uh, compliance matrix component value. And I can do that for every unique engineering constant. Um, and so at the end of the day, that is how we end up with, uh, with these particular results um, in, a, uh, in your uh, homogenized uh, theory. Okay. So let's move on to nonlinear material characterization. We'll be using the forward homogenization approach. A little uh, about the acronyms that I will be using. Uh, longitudinal tension, LT, is uh, a shorthand for a zero N laminate in tension, uh, as you can see here, loading in the direction of the fibers. LC is uh, longitudinal compression, shorthand for a zero N compression specimen. Uh, again, loading in the direction of the fibers, but in compression instead of tension, LT versus LC. The in-plane shear, uh, IPS, is shorthand for the 45 minus 45 NS tension specimen. So I have a 45 minus 45 that I'm going to pull in tension. It uh, defines my shear properties of the matrix. Uh, transverse tension, TT, is shorthand for a 90N tension specimen. And TC, transverse compression, uh, uh, identifies a 90N compression specimen. So the fibers um, perpendicular to the direction of the load, uh, whether it be tension or compression. And then we'll have a UNT unnotched tension or UNC unnotched compression, which could be any laminate, but for our case, it's going to be the quasi-isotropic laminate, uh, minus 45, 0, 45, 90 NS in tension or compression. Okay, uh, we're going to go through the nonlinear material characterization step. We'll do this in the uh, actual product here. So my unit cell model definition step is complete. I have a green check, and so is my linear material characterization is also complete. And the step that I'm on is nonlinear material characterization as it has no icon. So it says I'm ready to now perform the nonlinear material characterization. So when we go into that step, the first thing we're going to recognize is, is that, again, for each phase, we have to enter in some nonlinear 
uh, material parameters. Um, those parameters are already entered for you in the forward process because I selected a material from the constituent material database, uh, which knew both the uh, linear and the nonlinear properties of that particular uh, constituent material. So the matrix uh, has a orthotropic damage and rate independent plasticity law assigned to it for which the parameters associated with that are listed here. We will talk more about what these parameters are in a second. And the fiber has an axial isotropic damage bilinear law associated to it for which the parameters are defined here. So the complete material model is actually finished at this point. Um, I also have the laminates carried over from, uh, from my linear material characterization step. But what we want to do now is we want to do full virtual simulations to see how this uh, material model is behaving under uh, uh, various conditions. And so we want to define um, seven virtual simulations. We're going to define uh, LT, a longitudinal tension, uh, a TT, transverse tension, uh, an IPS, an in-plane shear, an LC, a longitudinal compression, TC, a transverse compression, and a uh, UNT and UNC, a notch tension and unnotch compression. So seven different uh, uh, virtual tests as if I had actually um, created these coupons and put them in the test machine. Um, and we want to see what the behavior of those laminates would be under the tension or compression environment. So we're going to define seven simulations. You can see when I did that, my seven tabs come up. For each tab, we're going to define the simulation. So I'm on simulation one tab. We're going to define that as our longitudinal tension specimen. That is our all zero laminate, zero in tension. Uh, so I'm going to put layup one in here. Layup one is uh, um, pointing to my layup one tab here, which is my all zero. Our test time is always one second. We're doing an implicit nonlinear analysis here. Uh, so we normalize to uh, one second. We're not doing any uh, transient behavior. Our maximum strain uh, could be anything that we define. I'm going to set it as 2%. It's kind of similar to what you would tell the test machine. Hey, just pull this to some max strain or max displacement. I don't know when it's going to break, but if it ever breaks before that, stop the test. And that's what this auto... Uh, uh, load loss of 20% is. It says, if, I don't know if it's going to break uh, uh, at 2% or not. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to break before that. I normally set it high, just like you would in a test machine. Uh, but if you uh, if it breaks before, as soon as you see a loss of 20%, stop the simulation. So we're not wasting computational cycles. Um, my delta T is minus 200. So this is actually doing a full thermal analysis before it's doing the mechanical loading analysis. So it is a two-step nonlinear uh, multi-scale simulation. Um, so it's going to do the thermal uh, first, just as if you had cured it, it cut out the coupon. Um, that's first simulation. And then when you put it into the test machine and apply the load, that's the second simulation. Um, so the number of increments, so each of these is nonlinear. We need to define the initial number of increments. It's fully adaptive. Uh, but we're going to take, uh, let's say, 10 thermal uh, increments. So that means I'm going in minus 20 degree Fahrenheit steps, and we're going to take 200 uh, mechanical increments. So that means I'm going in 100 micro strain uh, steps, at least to begin with. It is full adaptive um, nonlinear analysis. Um, okay, um, so that's the first simulation done. Uh, we'll do the other ones a little bit quicker because uh, we don't have to define them. So the second simulation is transverse tension. That's my 90 degree tension. That's going to be laminate two. So layup two is my all 90, which points to ID two. Um, we're going to pull that to 2% strain again, uh, my minus 200 delta T, my 10 thermal steps, and my 200 mechanical steps. Uh, my third simulation will be my in-plane shear. That is my laminate number three, which is my 45 minus 45, layup three, ID three. Um, again, we will pull that to 5%. So we'll go, uh, we know that the uh, in-plane shear can go much, much longer than the uh, zero degree tension or the 90 degree tension. So we'll pull that to 5%, um, at least as an initial maximum. Uh, we still have our minus 200 degree delta T for the cure environment. We have our 10 thermal steps, and now we have our 500 mechanical steps, because I always like at least initially going in 100 microstrain increments. Okay, we have, now let's do our compression. So we got our longitudinal compression, LC. That, again, is back to laminate one. Laminate one is my all zero. But now I'm going to tell the simulation, or as I tell the test machine, let's go minus 2%, so minus O2. Just reverse the direction that the load head is going, uh, or that I'm applying the load. 
I still have minus 200 delta T with my 10 load steps and my 200 mechanical steps, just that we're going in the negative direction now for compression. Okay, we have our transverse compression, uh, which is going to be laminate two, back to my uh, all 90 compression. Um, this one is very ductile, so uh, it's going to be minus 5%. Minus 0 0.05, there we go. Um, so minus 5%, uh, we got our minus 200 uh, degree Fahrenheit delta T with our 10 uh, thermal steps and our 500 mechanical steps, uh, initial anyway. We're going to do our um, unnotched tension, which is laminate 4 here to finish up. So that laminate 4 is my minus 45, 0, 45, 90. Uh, we're going to pull that to 2%. Uh, minus 200 delta T with my 10 increments and my 200 increments again. And my last simulation is going to be an unnatched compression. So again, laminate 4, but I'm going to go minus 2%. Okay, um, I've got everything uh, solved. The solution control um, I would leave as defaults. It's just defining a fundamental nonlinear um, uh, tolerancing parameters that you would see in any traditional nonlinear analysis. Indeed, this is uh, has an embedded finite element solution in it. We're going to be performing full multi-scale simulation. This is my macro model, uh, which will be a macro finite element model. Uh, it's just going to be a square finite element model, so it's very easy to build behind the scenes. And we're going to be hooking it up to this micro model, uh, which is defined as the homogenization plus the nonlinear uh, properties that we have. So this is going to do a full multi-scale simulation, uh, and we'll learn more about that as we go on through the sessions. But we're ready to go ahead and run this step, so we'll go ahead and hit run, uh, in which case uh, it will uh, perform these virtual simulations as if you had uh, put these coupons in a universal test machine and um, performed the test as defined. So you can see it's on uh, uh, the fifth simulation the sixth one is now done, and it's going to finish up with the seventh one in a second. Okay, so all seven simulations are complete. Uh, to look at our results, um, we normally would want to look at our results. Uh, well, the results of this step would be the same results that we would get out of the test machine, which would be stress-strain curves. Um, normally, I like looking at my results in Excel, so I'll just hit the Excel tab that will just automatically plot the stress strain curves for each of the simulations uh, in Excel nicely for you. Um, so uh, like you would get out of a uh, out of a test machine, the first, uh, uh, an automated report from the test machine, the first tab always shows the summary of all of the curves, uh, but really of more interest would be um, looking at each curve individually. So uh, each Simulation has a plot of the stress drain of that particular simulation, and it has the raw data right after that um, that you can uh, look at further. Um, but let's take a look at the plots here. So longitudinal tension um, goes up linear in the fiber direction. This is all zero tension, fails at about 270 KSI at about 1.5% strain, uh, pretty typical for a standard modulus carbon fiber. Um, Transverse tension, so this is my all 90 tension, quite a bit lower as expected. It only makes nine uh, KSI, not 270 uh, is what we expect. Very, very brittle, um, much less than a percent um, uh, strain. Um, my in-plane shear, this is my plus minus 45, which we'd expect to be very, very ductile as you see here, um, ultimately uh, failing at some equivalent strain. The longitudinal compression, so it's my zero degree compression, uh, goes uh, linear in the compression uh, regime and then fails at about 210 KSI <clears throat> at about 1.3%, so less than the tension, which is what we'd expect. <clears throat> the, uh, the compression environment would be uh, a more instable environment than the tension environment, which would be much more stable. Uh, transverse compression, so 90 degree compression, instead of being brittle, so 90 tension is very brittle. All I'm going to do is change the load and do 90 compression, and you can see that the behavior is very ductile, which is uh, reproducible uh, via experiment. Um, brittle behavior only happens in positive volumetric environments. This is a negative volumetric environment. I mean compression. So we end up uh, transitioning to the ductile behavior. The material model knows how to pick all of this uh, these behaviors up automatically unchanged um, from any 
particular property. Uh, unnotched tension. This just shows the progressive damage nature of the material model capabilities. Um, you can see here that as I'm going up, uh, it's a minus 45, 0, 45, 90. You can see that the 90s have brittle behavior, but that brittle behavior in the 90s is benign. Uh, the specimen can continue to go. Um, and so it knows damage that is benign versus damage that is critical. Um, and so when I finally uh, get to a point where the uh, fibers have been overloaded and a fiber fails, then that's critical damage and, um, and I can no longer sustain any load. So just showing the full progressive damage nature of these particular material models. Uh, and then of course, if I just change the load from tension to compression, I'll no longer get those 90 degree brittle behaviors because the 90s are in compression now. So then that behavior goes away, but I do get plasticity. This has got a slight uh, curve to it. Uh, and then ultimately the fibers are uh, overloaded in an instability uh, event and, uh, and you get your final, final failure there. Okay, um, so we've completed a complete forward process. So um, I always, at the end of a process, like I said before, save that step uh, and then close out. Uh, but before we end this session, let's talk a little bit more about uh, an introduction to the fundamental material behavior and an introduction to dehomogenization as to what actually happened in the program when we performed those virtual simulations. So a little disclaimer, in the following, I'm gonna be using rather significant engineering simplifications um, to describe pretty complex material behavior. But I'm, I'm doing that really uh, in order to achieve just a fundamental understanding. Um, the actual implementation details are significantly more rigorous than what I'm going to be presenting here. But I don't feel that that rigor really provides any additional clarity to just fundamental understanding. So if you will, allow me to make some relatively significant simplifications just so we can achieve a fundamental understanding. Okay, there are two fundamental material behaviors that exist in any material, brittle and ductile. Brittle characterized by elastic behavior followed by very little, if any, inelastic behavior. And ductile defined as elastic behavior followed by significant inelastic behavior. You can see the differences between the stress strain behaviors uh, of a brittle and a ductile material uh, down here below. Well, let's talk about these two behaviors relative to a couple of common materials. Um, so all materials have both behaviors, but most materials are dominated by one or the other. As an example, a glass. Well, glass, we all know, has, is brittle, a brittle material, and exhibits brittle material behavior. That's because the brittle material behavior is the weakest link. It has a ductile behavior, but you never see the ductile behavior because the brittle one always happens first. And so you end up with, with uh, material behavior very similar to, to the curve, the brittle curve shown here. Well, another class of materials that we could talk about would be something like aluminum or a ductile steel. These types of materials, uh, the ductile behavior is the weakest link. And we end up with uh, a large inelastic uh, regime after the elastic regime. Um, these materials have a brittle behavior, but again, the brittle behavior never uh, happens because the ductile behavior always happens first. The brittle behavior is much farther away uh, than the ductile behavior. However, plastics, which is what we're working with, um, and uh, um, you know, RFPs, reinforced plastic matrices, um, what's interesting about plastics is that the brittle and ductile behavior are actually very close to each other. We really never know which one is going to happen um, because, because they are so close. Sometimes we get the brittle behavior under certain states of general stress and strain, and sometimes we get the, the ductile behavior under certain states of stress and strain. And we'll talk about what states of stress or strain dominate brittle and ductile behavior next. But either one could happen in the plastic. It's very different than a glass or aluminum where it's very clear that one or the other will happen. Okay, so the brittle behavior of a material is dominated by the volumetric strain or strain energy. Uh, the volumetric strain is related to the mean stress through the bulk modulus as written here. It's very much like saying stress equals E strain, only that's in the normal space. We're going to be saying the mean stress equals the bulk modulus K times the volumetric strain, uh, which is uh, just written in the volumetric space <coughs> instead of the normal space. The mean stress, uh, if you have never seen this before, is 
the sum of the normal stresses divided by three. It is actually the mean stress. Uh, and the volumetric strain is the sum of the normal strains uh, without dividing by three, just the sum uh, as is. Uh, and the mean stress and the volumetric strain are related to each other through the bulk modulus K. Uh, and K is, if you know the Young's modulus in Poisson's ratio, K is E over three times one minus two B. Actually, the three uh, comes in here, uh, which is why we don't uh, divide by three in the volumetric strain, because the volumetric strain is actually a physical quantity, the actual change in volume over the original volume. Um, that's also known as J1, the first invariant of the strain tensor is the volumetric strain, because um, I might use that terminology uh, throughout. The uh, volumetric strain um, uh, controls the critical brittle behavior of materials. On the other side, we have the ductile behavior, uh, which is dominated by shear strain or shear strain energy. Um, and as we all know, when I take a coupon loaded in tension, uh, that at 45 uh, degrees relative to that normal direction, I have my max shear strain as uh, evidenced by our Mohr circle analysis of stress and strain here. Um, so um, tau equals G gamma uh, is our third equation, right? So we have stress equals E strain, the mean stress equals K volumetric strain and tau equals G gamma for isotropic materials, three fundamental equations for isotropic materials. Um, and we know that I can relate our normal stress to our shear stress on the 45 degree plane, that the shear stress is one half of the normal stress. And the shear strain on that 45 degree plane is one plus the Poisson's ratio times the normal strain. And if I put all that actually into stress equals E strain, I'll end up with G equals E over two times one plus V, which is a, another famous equation we, we all know to calculate the shear modulus given the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. <clears throat> okay. Um, so every phase of a material could have brittle or ductile modes. Therefore, uh, the total number of material behaviors that could exist is two times the number of phases. So for example, in our unidirectional materials, I have two phases. I have a matrix phase and I have a fiber phase. Um, and therefore, I have four total potential behaviors a matrix brittle behavior, a matrix ductile behavior, a fiber brittle behavior, and a fiber ductile behavior, which I also call the instability behavior. Okay, so you have two times the uh, number of phases of possible behaviors that, that could exist. Each behavior, we need to characterize that behavior with critical material parameters. Uh, so I have to, in order to do that, I have to uh, derive an experimental specimen that isolates that behavior. And indeed, we, we do have that. So for the matri matrix brittle damage uh, behavior and deriving the material parameters associated with matrix brittle behavior, we can use the trans, uh, transverse tension test specimen or the 90 degree tension specimen. As you can see here, when I test the 90 degree tension specimen, uh, of course I get uh, a very brittle behavior, it's linear and then fails suddenly. And from that I can get my homogenized Young's modulus in the two direction. I can get a two direction failure stress uh, and a two direction failure strain. But in, in multi-scale material models, I don't want the homogenized values. What I want are the matrix values. So this test specimen clearly fails in the matrix. Uh, and so I want to extract critical values in the matrix phase itself. We do that with dehomogenization, which I'm going to talk about next. But imagine that when I was doing this test specimen, instead of measuring the homogenized behavior, say uh, P over A, which I would measure from a load cell, or if I put a strain gauge on this, it's actually measuring the average behavior of all the, the fibers and all the matrix. It doesn't have an ability to measure just what's going on in just the matrix or just the fiber. But imagine that I could embed a micro strain gauge and a micro load cell in just the matrix phase. And that when I was doing this 90 degree tension test that I could record information from that micro strain gauge that was just embedded in the matrix phase. Well, I would get a curve that looks like this. Um, and uh, this curve is in the volumetric space. Imagine that the, the strain gauge was a volumetric strain gauge and the, the load cell was actually a, a mean stress load cell. Um, I could record what was going on in just the matrix phase itself. 
This is the information that we want in our material laws. Um, we're going to talk about how we do this, how we uh, transform a homogenized curve into the matrix curve, and we do that with dehomogenization. But for now, uh, let's suffice to say that this test allows me to extract a critical mean stress in the matrix and a critical J1 in the matrix, which give me the brittle behavior of the matrix phase, which are the numbers of the orthotropic damage and rate independent plasticity law, uh, 10 and 11, uh, as you see here. So they're not mysterious numbers anymore. Um, the next thing I need to do is I need to characterize the matrix ductile behavior, right? So I have the matrix brittle behavior characterized. Now I need the matrix ductile behavior. I would normally get that from an in-plane shear specimen, a 45 minus 45 N tension specimen. Again, um, when I do that specimen, I would get a typical plasticity curve, homogenized plasticity curve that involves a, you know, the yield stress, the tangent stress, a hardening slope, uh, maybe a, a plastic strain limit. These are all engineering numbers that we uh, know very, very well. <clears throat> but again, I do not want the homogenized curve for my material loss. I want what is going on in the matrix phase of this test. So again, if I could embed a uh, a strain gauge in a load cell in just the, the matrix phase, a micro uh, strain gauge in load cell. And if I were to record that information as I were loading, again, I would see something very similar, but I'm looking at a yield stress in the matrix, a tangent stress in the matrix, a hardening slope in the matrix, and an equivalent plastic strain limit in the matrix phase itself. Um, and so you can see here, sigma y, sigma one, which is the tangent stress, uh, the hardening slope h, uh, and the plastic strain limits here. The additional terms, delta and beta, we're going to talk about next, uh, define this radius between the yield stress and the tangent stress. So this delta and these betas just define what the shape of the uh, uh, radius looks like between yield and tangent. Uh, so again, these numbers are not mysterious anymore. Number uh, parameters 1 through 9, uh, 10 and 11 were the brittle ones. So all the parameters are no longer mysterious. They're actually very straightforward, uh, well-understood engineering numbers. Um, that go into this particular uh, material model. So uh, no empirical uh, uh, um, uh, numbers at all. These are straight up uh, physics-based numbers. Let's talk a little bit about the delta. Um, so delta is uh, the, uh, defines the radius and between the yield stress and the tangent stress. And so if I had a perfect plasticity, H of zero, if I have a delta of zero, I would end up with perfect plasticity at the yield stress. And if I had a delta of infinity, I would end up with perfect plasticity at the tangent stress. And so what delta does is it effectively pushes this line up in to uh, in between the uh, perfect plasticity at the yield and perfect plasticity at the tangent. It would push that line up into it. Uh, when it hits it, it obviously will start uh, creating the radius um, and so from zero to infinity, you're just creating a, a tighter and tighter and tighter radius uh, into, uh, into those particular curves. And so that's what delta does, um, just defines what that, that radius looks like. It's uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Beta is uh, a little bit more, um, uh, this one is just defining the shape of that curve. Beta is actually uh, including some well-understood physics associated with volumetric strain effects on the yield stress and tangent stress. Um, so the yield stress uh, and the tangent stress of most materials is a function of the volumetric strain environment. There's actually an infinite number of yield stresses and tangent stresses uh, for a material. Um, as you can see here, uh, when I am in a compressive volumetric environment, J1 is less than zero, my yield stress and my tangent stress tend to increase, which um, is well understood in engineering terms. And if my uh, volumetric environment is positive or I'm in a tension in, uh, environment, my yield stress and my tangent stress tend to decrease. Um, so I actually have an infinite number of curves. Uh, what you can see though, is that the yield stress and the tangent stress as a function of the volumetric environment is largely a linear uh, uh, relationship. And so uh, beta is just the slope of the yield and tangent stress uh, to the J1 strain. Uh, so defining a linear functional uh, between these things. Um, the values are typically somewhere between zero and, and 0.5. Uh, 
uh, most common for polymers, uh, 0.15. Okay, um, so we got the matrix phase done. Uh, we need to talk about the fiber phase now. So I've got a brittle damage uh, uh, material parameters that have to be uh, characterized for the fiber phase. Uh, we can do that with our uh, longitudinal tension specimen, our zero end tension specimen, except same story again. Um, uh, if I uh, uh, put the longitudinal tension specimen into a test machine, I would characterize the homogenized curve. I get a, a Young's modulus in the one direction. I get a failure stress in the one direction and a failure strain in the one direction. But that isn't what I want. What I want is uh, the information in the fiber phase alone, as if I had embedded a micro strain gauge and load cell in just the fiber phase. What would it record during this test? Um, and I'm looking for the uh, stresses at failure in the fiber and the strains at failure in the fiber. Um, and we do that again with dehomogenization. Uh, and you can see uh, the numbers that we get here are fiber numbers in tension. So not mysterious numbers again. And then I can do the same thing with compression. I just take my longitudinal compression, my zero end compression specimen. But again, I'm looking for information in the fiber phase, not homogenized. And uh, uh, we get that via the dehomogenization theory. Uh, and you can see the numbers in the fiber that, that I would get here. Okay, so all of the numbers, that's all of the numbers needed uh, in the matrix and fiber phase to fully characterize the damage laws for this entire unidirectional material. Um, so again, not mysterious uh, numbers, uh, highly physics-based uh, uh, damage laws using very little empiricism, if any, uh, at all. Maybe only delta can be considered uh, an empirical parameter, uh, possibly. Okay, so let's finish up this session with an introduction to dehomogenization theory. So we talked about homogenization, uh, which was upscaling. Now we're going to talk about dehomogenization, which is downscaling. So I have information at the homogenized product, and I want to calculate the phase stresses or strains given the homogenized stresses or strains. So we're kind of create, uh, we're kind of uh, completing the full circle, uh, the full loop here uh, with dehomogenization. There are two fundamental approaches. There is a direct homogenization approach, which is actually the exact solution. Uh, and there are reduced order model approaches, or ROMs, which are approximate solutions. So uh, unlike in homogenization, where we went for the exact solution, uh, in dehomogenization, we're going to be talking about approximate solutions because the exact solution is too computationally expensive still uh, to these dates. What's interesting is that the reduced order models, there are many, many of them, have gotten very, very accurate, and uh, and that's what's changed in the last half a decade to uh, to a decade or so, is how accurate these reduced order models have have uh, become. Okay, but before we get into the reduced order models, let's talk about the direct homogenization. So if we could solve this problem uh, completely, uh, we would do it with direct homogenization, and maybe in several decades down the road, we will be switching to direct homogenization. But uh, for now, um, Let's just describe what direct homogenization is. What's important to understand is, is that multi-scale means I have a model within a model. So we normally talk about that as the macro model and the micro model. So it's a model within a model. Both the macro model and the micro model are full nonlinear finite element models. Um, so I'm always at some given increment of load. Uh, and at that increment of load, I have a converged macro model. And once I have a converged macro model at some increment of load, I can throw that converged strain state down to the micro model for every single Gauss point inside the macro model. So I have N micro models inside the macro model, specifically one for every Gauss point. Um, so the macro model throws the strain, converged strain uh, environment down to the micro model. I can apply that strain, much like I talked about applying the strain in the homogenization theory, to the uh, to the micro model, and I can solve it nonlinear. So for some given uh, strain state, there is no guarantee that I don't have a damage in one phase or the other. So uh, if I have damage in one phase or the other, it will nonlinear converge on that particular damage state in one phase or the other or both. And when it's fully converged to that macro strain state, it will re-homogenize because I could have had some damage, which will obviously produce some sort of softening in the phases. 
once I have that softening, I can re-homogenize the unit cell because I need to throw the homogenized stiffness back to the macro model so that it can continue on to its next increment. And so you can imagine as I'm describing this that the computational requirements to do this are actually relatively large. Um, actually to solve a, a simple open hole specimen like this with full direct homogenization, even with today's computational power, requi requires quite uh, a large um, uh, compute resource uh, to solve it in a reasonable uh, amount of time. Uh, and by reasonable, we're talking still uh, on the order of days uh, amount of time, or probably on the order of a day amount of time. Um, and so that's the, the, the problem with direct homogenization. While it's incredibly accurate, it really just is not computationally efficient. And so what researchers have done uh, over the last decade or so um, is that they've been looking at ways to uh, retain computational, uh, that retain the accuracy, but gain computational efficiency. And we do that through reduced order models. Reduced order models are really just another form of machine learning, uh, actually, or artificial intelligence. So this fits very nicely into the current topics of MLAI. Um, ARAM actually is a, a, an MLAI approach um, to these particular solutions. Um, so nothing has changed in everything that we've talked about. I still have a macro model at some given increment and I have to converge my solution at that given load increment. And once I've done that, I can throw that converged strain state down to the micro model except that the micro model is no longer a full finite element model. Now it's a reduced order model. It's an analytic uh, uh, solution that I can still solve nonlinear. So it's a nonlinear uh, uh, equation, set of equations, uh, but I can solve those much faster than I can solve the full finite element model. Um, and I do the same thing, um, except we're doing it with this reduced order model. Uh, we can identify whether uh, uh, um, damage has happened in one phase, the other, or both. I can... Uh, uh, soften the phases due to that damage environment, and then I can re-homogenize and I can send the homogenized stiffness back to the macro model at every single Gauss point. I have to do this at every Gauss point, except that this happens much, much faster than the direct homogenization. Um, the exact reduced order model that we have implemented in multi-scale designer is Jacob Fish's um, uh, reduced order model. It's well documented in his book, Practical Multiscaling. It's a, a fantastic book. Um, if you want to uh, look into the further details of the uh, homogenization and dehomogenization or upscaling and downscaling uh, approach that, that is actually implemented in Multiscale Designer, um, you can uh, go ahead and grab his, his book as a reference. Okay, so Let's dive in a little bit more to the fundamental concept of this reduced order model. And I will explain these concepts via uh, what's called phase average theory. And I will do that uh, in the elastic portion only. So this is not, I can't uh, stress enough, this is not uh, what is implemented in multi-scale designer, uh, but it allows us to understand some of the details of what is, is implemented so that we get a feeling for what is actually going on. Because um, this particular theory, uh, our particular ROM theory in the elastic uh, uh, regime is easy enough to understand. Um, so um, I have some homogenized strain environment at every Gauss point in my macro model. Uh, and in addition to that, I can write some constitutive equations for the homogenized material, stress equals C strain. Uh, it's like saying stress equals E strain only in full 3D. I can write uh, the same thing for the matrix material. Uh, so the stress of the matrix equals the strain, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the stiffness matrix of the matrix times the strain of the matrix. And I can write the same thing for the fiber that the stress, uh, I think I should have said stress of the matrix. The stress of the fiber equals the stiffness matrix of the fiber times the strain of the fiber. So I have these three constitutive equations which are easy enough uh, to write. Um, I also have phase average theory, which says that the homogenized stress or strain is related to the constituent stress or strain via the volume fractions. Um, and so this does hold uh, for actually an end phase uh, material, but for a two phase material, we can actually solve it. So uh, the process here is I'm going to take these constitutive equations and I'm going to put them into the stress phase average uh, equation. So you can see I'm going to substitute the homogenized stress for the homogenized stiffness matrix and the homogenized strain into here. 
uh, the uh, uh, homo or the average matrix stress uh, uh, into here and the average fiber stress into here. Uh, and I end up with this uh, first equation here. So now I've written the uh, stress phase average equation in terms of the uh, stiffness matrices of the homogenized product, the matrix and the fiber, uh, and the strains, uh, homogenized strains and the uh, uh, matrix strains and the fiber strains. And I have a volume fraction uh, of associated with those phases involved. Okay, well, I have one further equation. I can simply replace the fiber strain times the volume fraction uh, by uh, changing this equation around, taking the matrix strain and volume fraction to the left-hand side, and then just replacing that uh, in here. And so I end up with a homogenized strain times the fiber stiffness and a matrix average strain in its volume fraction times the fiber stiffness. Okay, well, in this equation, I have two strains. Uh, actually, I have one unknown. Uh, the homogenized strain is known. I get it from the macro model. And all of the stiffnesses are known. I know the stiffness, the homogenized stiffness. I did uh, uh, upscaling. Um, I know the stiffness matrix of the matrix. I know the stiffness matrix of the fiber. The, and I know the volume fractions. That's just product data information. The only thing I don't know in this equation is the strain of the matrix. So I'm just going to uh, manipulate this equation to get the strain of the matrix on the left-hand side and everything else on the right-hand side. And what pops out of this is that the strain of the matrix, which I'm trying to find, is equal to some uh, calculation of the stiffness matrices of the homogenized product, the matrix, and the fiber times the homogenized strain, which I get from the finite element model. So it says if I know the homogenized strain and I know all these stiffness matrices, I can calculate what's going on in the matrix phase. If you would, this is our micro strain gauge right here, this, this little box. Well, this box, the stiffness matrices, remember, are six by sixes. So I have operations on six by six matrices. And what I end up with in this box is just another six by six matrix. So kind of boiled all the way down, it says that the strain in the matrix phase is just some six by six matrix, which I can calculate. It's a function of all these stiffness matrices times the strain of the macro model. So it means if I know the strain of the macro model and I know this, this, oper this six by six amplification matrix, we call it the A matrix, I can actually calculate what's going on in the matrix. And then if I know the strains in the matrix, I know the stresses. So let me, uh, the stiffness matrix, I get the stresses in the matrix. Well, same thing with the fiber. I can just reorder this entire process to get what uh, the amplification matrix of the fiber. It's just a six by six uh, equation. And so at the end of the day, what we end up with is a lot of these six by six matrices. What these ROMs are, are just a whole bunch of these six by six matrices that we're just operating on. Um, and so I'm only going to talk about the elastic portion here. There's a whole inelastic portion. Uh, the elastic portion is called these A matrices, the amplification matrices. The uh, inelastic uh, portion we call the P matrices. I actually don't know why we use the letter P. Maybe it was only one of the other letters left. Um, but uh, we won't talk about this phase, uh, this portion of the equation, because I don't think it offers any um, any. Uh, further fundamental understanding than, than what we can get from the elastic portion. Same thing happens in the inelastic, just much more complicated. But if I were to look at this A matrix in the matrix uh, phase uh, and just look at the diagonal components, what you're going to see is, is that the diagonal components are, are on the order of, of a factor of two. And what that says is, is that the strains in the matrix, the actual strains in the matrix are two times the homogenized strain. So whatever my homogenized strain is in the ply, um, the actual strain in the matrix on average is two times larger than that particular strain. If I look at the A matrix in the fiber, and I could, uh, when I did that, that calculation out, what you're going to see is about 0.2. So not two, 0.2, about one fifth. Um, and what this says is, is that the strain in the fiber is about a fifth of the homogenized strain. So whatever the homogenized strain is, what the strain, uh, the actual strain in the fiber is about a fifth of that. So this should kind of give you a little bit of an aha moment that we've been operating on these homogenized strains, these ply strains, um, and using different various first ply failure criteria. Um, and it really probably shouldn't be that uh, much of a stretch to say, well, yeah, it's probably clear now why those criteria struggled to be very predictive because what's actually going on in the matrix and the fiber is two times or one fifth, two times larger or one fifth smaller 
Uh, and that's where the material is actually having issues where it's behaving, not in this homogenized thing. And so if I'm operating on a result that's two times uh, potentially a, a half smaller or five times larger, thinking about it the other way, if I'm operating on a number that's that's off by two or, or five, um, how could I possibly really uh, uh, have any act, uh, predictive accuracy? And that's actually why the homogenized criteria have struggled with uh, physics uh, predictive nature. Uh, they work perfectly fine in an empirical sense, but uh, from a predictive physics nature, they they struggle, and this is exactly why. Um, we have to operate, we have to dehomogenize to get what's going on in the individual phases themselves. And once we do that, um, everything starts coming back in. I want to leave you with one last thought, which is that through that entire process of developing the material model, uh, what we really did was create this uh, underscore MDS mat.dat file, which is the multi-scale designer reduced order model. It is all of the material matrices needed to solve the micro uh, model ROM. And it is what you have to include in your simulation model um, as the multi-scale material model in order to do a full multi-scale simulation. So this is your material model. Um, I'll show it to you, the one that you just created. So... Um, by default, um, multi-scale designer is operating on your personal library, which is under uh, by default in my documents, uh, multi-scale designer. And you can see all my materials. The material that we created was called uni uh, forward. So if I go down to the use, um, uni forward, there it is. It creates a folder for every material that you create in the system. Um, and then we created a, a mechanical material model. And you can see here the underscore MDS mat dot dat. And if I were to look at this particular file, what you're going to notice is, is that it is uh, just loaded with these six by six matrices. Um, here are the A's that we just talked about for the matrix phase and for the fiber phase. And we'll use this uh, information a little later in the uh, inverse characterization process. But this file is your material model. It does define completely the ROM. It is what you need to include. Um, there's many, many of these matrices. Um, I uh, briefly describe what these matrices are. They shouldn't be so mysterious uh, any anymore. Okay, with that, uh, I think we can conclude our first session on um, multi-scale material model development using the forward process. Thank you.